All right, so I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, what we do at NDSSL. I think it's something of a mystery to, to some people who don't know us so well. Uh, okay, where's the arrow? On the keyboard. Thank you. Um, as Manov said, we, we try to influence policy by providing evidence-based support for decisions. And uh, this involves working with policymakers who, even more so than biologists, have never seen a command line prompt in their life. Um, and the, the kind of evidence base that we try to provide is based on the science of these interacting massive systems that are, have no particular symmetries or homogeneities in them. And uh, the best word, I th think, to describe them is just messy. Even though we don't have a wet lab, we work on really messy stuff. Um, we, we have put together or evolved, really, a multidisciplinary team, so team that works on transdisciplinary science. Uh, and we're focused on building synthetic information tools that decision makers can use. And we're driven by real world problems that our stakeholders define themselves. So, what do we mean by synthetic information? This is a, a, a way of modeling systems that we have kind of inherited from our longtime colleague, Dick Beckman, who, who gave us a push in this direction when we were, we were working on transportation systems. Synthetic information is a representation of a system that tells you a lot of statistically correct uh, associations within the system. It's not that we're trying to take a snapshot of the real world and put it into the computer somehow so that everything that you see out there is, can be referenced to something in here. It's trying to identify the most relevant aspects of a problem and capture the, the, uh, the statistics of them. Uh, we, we work a lot with populations, so we talk about synthetic populations, but these could be populations of anything, not just people in places, but cells or cytokines. We call it synthetic because it's both synthesized in the sense of built from, from other parts, and it's, uh, it's fusing a whole bunch of, of incommensurate data. So big data is something that we've been living for, for 20 years. Whatever was big at the time, we were in the middle of it. Uh, and it, it's more than just a lot of data. It's data that was never meant to work together. And when we create synthetic information systems, we try to find ways to make that data work together and, and provide insight into the system dynamics. Uh, another way to think of this that, that Chris likes to, to, to describe is this is a coordinate system for adding more data. So if you have, for example, a synthetic population, and then you find out something about uh, risk factors that you think might be useful in, in personalized medicine, you can add those the information about those risk factors onto the synthetic population that you already have. So it's like a coordinate system for, for adding information. Um, all of this relies on the ability to, to, to represent causal mechanisms at work in very complex interacting systems. And I'm going to describe socio-technical systems, but this is not uh, a, a real restriction in what we do. So you can think of, of individual behaviors. And we spend a lot of time in reductionist science trying to identify how things work when you pull them apart. But as has been mentioned several times this morning, what really matters is how those individual behaviors operate in the context of whatever is going on around them. You find that when you really represent all these, the, the context as well as the individual behaviors, you get collective phenomena that emerge at all kinds of different scales in the system. And that you have feedback between the, the large scales and the small, the long time scales and the short time scales, the large spatial scales and the short spatial scales. And this is what makes the system so complex. The challenges in, in understanding a system like this are uh, uh, figuring out how to take the data that's available and match it to what you really need to know about the system at different scales, different, uh, uh, different kinds of data. Um, figuring out the challenge that we're presented with by decision makers is typically, I have limited resources to, to affect changes in this system. How do I do it? What's the most efficient way to control the system with the limited resources that I have? Um, we find that we have to work on very large systems 
uh, trillions of, of interacting entities. Uh, we, we have constraints on the kinds of experiments we can do. In social systems, it's obvious. You can't just reach into a social system and do a, a, a RCT, a randomized controlled trial. Um, we need to understand how to extract information from natural experiments about uh, hypotheses we, we might generate. Uh, and then the, the, the ones that everybody has issues with who has anything to do with modeling, which is distinguishing causation from correlation, quantifying the uncertainty and the results that we get. So I'm going to describe this, what I just talked about, in the context of uh, one particular study that we did. Uh, the, most of the lab was involved in this over the course of uh, half a year or more, which was a, a, a terrible catastrophe in downtown Washington, D.C. It's a, it's a bomb going off. And the way this has been studied in the past has been to produce a picture like this. This is pretty much the end result of most other studies. So there's a plume of nasty stuff coming out of the, of the explosion area, and there's physical damage all around it. And you look at this and you say, well, that's terrible. But what we pointed out was that you can, what you do after that event has very little to do with the, the physics of what caused the event. It's something about the social systems, how people behave. And what you want to do to mitigate casualties is to, to manage people's behavior after the event. So for example, we, have, we look at the individuals that are involved in the event. Here's a household, Alice and Bob and their, their child, Carol. And it's, it's simple things like, where are they all when this thing happens? that influence the decisions that each of those people make. And the, the decisions that they make, I've listed some on the right, are the things that, that, that drive how those people come into contact with your efforts at mitigation, um, what, what resources they'll need, um, and eventually how many, what the casualties would be like. So this is just one household, and what happens when you put all the households together is that you get these collective phenomena that, are, that you have to understand if you want to be able to effectively mitigate damage in an event like this. So it's, the question is, how do we take this understanding of how the, the, the micro-scale dynamics placed in context create macroscopic phenomena, how do we align that with the responses that we're making in trying to control the system? So, like I said, we're not restricted to working on social systems. I can make the same picture. It doesn't come out terribly well, but um, this is work that we've done with the, the NIML lab, Joseph's lab, um, where we, we, the entities that we're representing are different. There are cytokines and cells in the immune system. The interactions are completely different. And it's, it's kind of easy for me to make a picture like this but what I want to try to, what I don't have time to do, but what I'd like to convince you of, is that we can, we can actually make this analogy precise and use the tools that we develop in one area for the other because it's all based on a, a mathematical formalism, a theory of interacting systems that's both computational and mathematical. So things that we understand about this system high-performance computing tools that we build for massively interacting systems can be applied in both these arenas. Um, and it's when we put the two together, the, the synthetic information systems and the simulations, that we, we get insight into the problem. This probably doesn't want to run. Uh, so those were movies that, that don't seem to be wanting to run. The, the, demonstrate how simulation together with, uh, with the synthetic information gives you insight into what's going to happen in, in systems as complex as these. We provide these things as tools to decision makers, policy makers, and they change the, the way the policy makers work. So instead of each person having their own particular view of what's going on, they can communicate through these tools. So, I, I have some domain expertise, and I'm going to make a change that I think is going to help control this part of the system. But in order to explain to other people what effect that's going to have in the system, we can, we can provide them with a tool that lets them look at the system in ways they're used to. 
Um, a, a wonderful example of this has been our work in Ebola over the last nine months now. Uh, and I, uh, we've, we've described this before. What I'm really proud of is that I think the, the um, information that we provided, the evidence for, for policy effects, has actually helped the response to Ebola. So that's what I'm most proud of. I'm also proud of the fact that we figured out how to do all this within the context of an academic environment. So that out of the course of doing this work, we ended up with letters in PNAS, Nature and Science, and, and publications in good places. Um, this is supposed to be a talk about history. I'm just gonna flash this slide of other things, other similar studies that we have, we've done over the last few years. Uh, there's, a, there's quite a demand for this kind of work. Um, and then briefly just mention that these are areas that we think we have unique insight into and that we plan to be exploring over the next few years. Urban resilience, we've already put in some proposals with others on campus on, uh, related to urban resilience. Um, formalizing the, the information synthesis pro process. It's, it's become much bigger than just creating a synthetic population and we need to formalize what we're doing there. Uh, looking at multi-scale, multi-theory interactions, figuring out how to take advantage of the immense data resources that are out there but are very uh, hard to manage right now. Uh, we're building out a set of global synthetic information resources that we think will be uh, the, the foundational structure of our lab for the next few years. And we're incorporating our tools into ecosystems, ours and others' ecosystems, to make them more available to policymakers. And Keith will take over from there. <laughs>